He says these words, For nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. Mary just heard that she's going to become pregnant without the help of a man. Okay, if you're thinking of things that are impossible, that would be it. But nothing's impossible with God. God can do that. And what is the reason that God is doing this amazing thing that's never been done before? The angel records it in Luke chapter 2 as he talks to the shepherds. He says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. What is it? What is God doing that you know, has never been done before? Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. Amen. A Savior. Not a king. Not a good man. Not a teacher. A Savior has been born to you because that's what the world so desperately needs. It needs a savior. We need a savior. The impossible baby had come to do the impossible to save us. And indeed, this was the mission of Jesus, to seek and to save that which was lost. And we looked at Luke chapter 18, this rich young ruler and his confusion about what good really means. Just a little bit later, we come to the story of Zacchaeus. This, this tax collector, this man who knew he wasn't good, this man who, who lived a materialistic life and benefited from cheating other people. That's what he did. And Jesus comes to, to meet him and goes to his house and, and changes his life. And in the midst of that story, at the end of that story, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. The whole mission of Jesus the whole reason he came was to seek and to save Man. what was lost. That's why Jesus came for us, to save us, so that we could be rightly related with God. Now it's interesting if you contrast this rich young ruler with Zacchaeus. The rich young ruler thought he had it all right. He was doing everything right. And yet when Jesus called him to radical obedience, he just couldn't do it. But when Jesus shows up to a guy who's doing everything wrong, and knows it, and he invites him into a relationship, this man just grabs a hold of it. And we know he grabs a hold of it because he becomes changed. And the man who lived all about himself and all about gaining whatever he could now becomes a man who's ready to give massive amounts of his wealth away. And in response to this evidence of change in this man's life, what does Jesus say? He says, today salvation has come to this house. Amen. Because that's why I came. I came to bring salvation to those who can't save themselves. Jesus other places would say, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. What's he saying? He's saying, it's those that recognize their need that will come to me in faith. But good people won't because they think they're okay on their own. They don't really believe that they need me. How many of us sitting here, how many people that we interact with, if we really talk with them about it, maybe you think you need some help from Jesus. Maybe you know you can't quite get over the hump on your own. But if we really push you, you might say, you know what, but I, but I got a lot of the way there. Or I got some of the way there. I've been up a pretty good life. Many of you could probably say that. But let's challenge that for a minute. Is that really true in God's standard? See, what we often do is we look at the people around us and we say, I've lived a pretty good life compared to that or compared to this person. And so we end up feeling like we, we're pretty good. But when we look at the standard of Jesus, we recognize that none of us have lived a good life. I love what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't love it because it certainly doesn't make me feel good, but I love it that it, it bursts through our, our potential view of goodness of ourselves. He talks about, you know, you've heard it said, do not murder. Oh, yeah, Jesus, that's right. Don't kill anybody. We're right on with that one. Just like the rich young ruler. Got that one down. Done that one. And what he says, I say to you, if you've gotten angry with someone and spoken harshly to them, that is just as if you've murdered them. What? What? I didn't take anybody's life. There's no crime in what I did. It's not about the legal system. It's about your heart. And that, that anger that flows out of your heart is the same anger that leads to murder, whether you've literally done the act or not. And Jesus says, you think you're okay if you just haven't done this act. I'm telling you that from your heart perspective, from what God sees, that that anger that is in your heart is just as ugly to God. Now, I know the consequences of the same. I understand that speaking harshly to someone is not the same thing as taking their life physically. 
But you have to understand, in God's standard, He sees our badness the same, whether we've fulfilled the physical act or not. Let's move on. He talks about, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Yeah, that's right, Jesus. I've stayed faithful to my wife. I've, I've remained with her. He says, well, I say to you, if you've looked at another woman and desired her, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. Oh, boy. Why did you have to go there? Mm. I thought I was good. And you're telling me that if I even just look at another woman and, and, and have thoughts that I encourage and, and go down a little bit in my mind concerning her in a way that's inappropriate, that that puts me in the same category with the person who just willfully goes out and sleeps with somebody else who isn't their wife. I thought I was better than that. Mm. So do a lot of us sitting here. Yeah, amen. And Jesus would say, wait a minute. Yeah, maybe you haven't gone ahead and done the act. Who of you could sit here this morning and say, perhaps you haven't looked at something you shouldn't have looked at? Mm. You haven't gone down roads in your mind as you've seen somebody that you shouldn't have gone down. We're not as good as you think we are. When we measure ourselves by the standard of God. And I got to tell you, it's a little bit depressing. <laughs> because honestly, religion, so much of religion is about being good. And measuring ourselves against others to see how good we are. So many world religions teach you that if you hold to these standards, you're going to be okay. Christianity comes along and says, you can't hold on to the standard. There is no way, no how. You can't do it. That's why Paul writes, by obeying the law will no one be saved. You can't get there yourself. You are desperately, desperately lost. We can't do it. And I'm telling you, unless we get that through our heads, unless we just look at our sinfulness in the face, in the full ugliness of it, so that we don't even want to look. If we can see ourselves in a mirror and see ourselves, now hear me all the way through, as God sees our sin, the way God sees it, we would turn away in disgust. Every single one of us. Every single one of us. That's why we need a savior. It's just not a nice thing. It's just not a helpful thing to get us the rest of the way. It's not a buddy just to come alongside and say, you know what? I see you're out of gas. I'll help you with that extra goodness that you can't quite come up with on your own. No, Jesus comes to us and says, you are drowning in the ocean and there's no boat or rescue in sight. You're going down. Unless you reach out and hold on to me. I'm the only one who can rescue you. Zacchaeus understood that. The rich young ruler did. And the difference is huge. The difference is huge. Turn to John chapter 3. The last place I want to have you go this morning. Probably one of the most famous chapters, at least one of the most famous verses in the Bible we find in John chapter 3. In this chapter we meet another man who was raised to believe he was good. He was one of the ruling council. He was one of the 71 men who made up the Judean Supreme Court. This was one of the highest positions that you could hold. He was highly religious, he was highly devoted, and he was highly troubled. And so he comes to Jesus at night because people would ask questions if he came to him openly during the day. And he is not coming this time as a challenger. He's coming as a questioner. He's got questions and he needs answers. And his name is Nicodemus. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. Verse 1. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. He starts with some good, encouraging statement to Jesus. Here's what we know. We know that no man could do what you do without God's help or intervention. 